This knife is almost done. I need to sharpen it up. But before that, I do that, I'm going to make a blade cover for it. It can be just something simple. Uh, but obviously, it's a bit of a fancier knife. I'm going to make a bit of a fancier blade cover. But it, like all knife sheaths and things like that, it starts out by just tracing the blade. And this style, I think I'm going to make a sandwich style sheath. Well, cover. It's not going to have any belt loop or anything like that on it. So I just need an outline of the blade and I'll go from there. Uh, like I said, it's not sharpened up yet. It's getting close, but not quite. And this is a good time to do this type of work. So that once you do have it sharpened, you can cover it and not get cut by it while you're trying to do the finishing touches. Part of the reason I'm doing a sandwich style instead of a fold over, and by sandwich style I mean there's going to be a front and a back piece and a spacer in between and they're all going to be layered together like a sandwich instead of a piece that folds over and has one piece folded and just a spacer in between them. Um, But I want to have a wide enough piece to do some tooling on it. And it's going to be basically as wide as the blade. But if you do a fold over piece, your fold kind of starts right here behind the blade. And then you've got a bit of it kind of taken up there that's going to be rolled. And you don't have a nice flat surface. Um, not as good of a tooling because then you'll stretch your tooling out. Um, you can, of course, do stamping that'll wrap around. But some of your tooling will get messed up if you do it too much of a tight bend on it. So I'm going to bring this piece up a bit. And back down. And the reason I want that is I'm going to put a retaining strap around this. But if it's a little loose, if it, um, just from it being folded over, and that knife can move a little bit, I don't want this sharp corner to come out. I want it to pull up and still have a piece of leather there to protect people. The retaining strap, that piece is going to look very similar to this, only behind the knife here, and we're going to go up, and if we want it to fold straight down here, it's going to go straight up. If we want it to fold across and end over here, then it's going to be a different shape. It's going to turn up this way so that when it folds down. And that's a really plain shape, so let's do something else with that. And if this is starting to look somewhat familiar to anybody, it's because I am kind of mimicking the handle curves on the knife. Even though it's going to be reversed, if you have this curve sticking up here and you've got a similar curve that's the part that's folded down, it all goes together better. There, that can be our retaining strap then. So the back piece will look like this whole thing. The front piece will look like just if we cut this part off and our spacer be just what's between these lines along here. Now I could have looked around all day for a piece of scrap and tried to make this out of some scraps, but I just went straight to a good piece of leather on this one. Um, this is a piece of, I think, six ounce Herman Oak leather, or thereabouts. It's five to six or six to seven, I can't remember which. It's about six ounces. And you'll notice I'm not following right along this edge. It can be really tempting to just go ahead and lay your pieces out and follow an edge like that. Um, but it's not always a good idea. Because you want your patterns on anything like this, like a holster or a knife sheath or something like that. It's really best to lay them out where they're either 
following directly parallel are directly perpendicular to the backbone of the hide. And in this case, I'm running perpendicular to it. Um, but if you don't, if you go just diagonal or whichever way seems to make sense by the edge you're at, sometimes once you put your piece together, it'll twist and the whole thing will just not ever want to lay straight. Did I turn that over? No, I did. I, I turned it over. So um, when you're laying out a pattern, and what I thought I just did is I laid out one piece, and I thought I just moved over and laid the other piece, but no, I turned it over, which is the way I, I want to do it, because then I have this good leather, and not my lining leather, is going to be the outside of the sheath. This will be the front, this will be the back. And you just basically reverse your pattern. So for a second there, I thought, uh-oh, I didn't do that. But it turns out I did without even thinking about it. I'm only punching this one right now. I can move this one around a little bit later if I need to, at least within the width of the snap. Um, and I'll be punching through both layers of this. But once I line this, I want to have the snap already in there when I glue the liner in. Liner isn't really necessary for this, but to keep the back of that snap from rubbing against the knife and messing with the finish on it, you'd at least want to glue a little bit of leather or felt or something over top of that. And then that could be problematic with the knife sliding back and forth past it. I prefer to just do a full liner and I use a cheaper leather for that. And speaking of cheaper leather, let's find the pieces for the lining, which uh, I've got a piece laying around here and a piece to cut the spacer out of. Okay, all the pieces. That's eventually going to be a knife cover. Now, I'm going to do a stitching groove around here just to help me figure out where I'm going to be able to do any carving or not. And then that area is going to be covered. So we'll make a bit of a mark there. Just a real light, maybe barely see on the camera, mark that I'll be able to find later. So I can lay everything out. And again, like I said, nowhere I'm able to do any tooling. Mark a border in from the stitch line with a scratch on oh, the uh, divider here. And do the same to make a border right along where that piece was going to be. So there was a request from the person I'm making the knife for to put a bear on the sheet. Not a teddy bear, an actual like bear. Um, so I found, looked around and I found I do have a craft aid pattern. Uh, craft aids are plastic sheets with raised ridges on it. And it has a bunch of different animals, including a couple different bears. So I do have a pattern for one. 
My only experience with carving a bear is the practice piece I just did on a piece of scrap a few minutes ago. Um, it turned out okay, I think, so we'll probably go with a bear and then fill in the rest with some basket weave. Craft aids are always wonderful. You get to skip the tracing your pattern and tracing it on and just jump right to the fun part of carving. Now this pattern has um, some rough lines like I'm supposed to do cuts into it as I go. Uh, and I'm not actually doing that right off. I'm going to bevel it first with some somewhat smoother lines and then come back and put that fur texture in later. One thing I always pay attention to in all of my carvings are places like this right here where you can see that arm of the bear there the front leg and you see it's not quite separated from the background there real well didn't quite get up into that corner really good and I always like to try and go back and use something to get into those corners and really push them down and I think it makes a big difference on the appearance of how deep your carving looks. You're not actually carving any deeper, but you get the illusion of depth if you make sure you push all those things down. Now, like a lot of figure carving, a bunch of this can be done with a modeling tool. And you're going to have to do some stuff with modeling tools anyway around. Uh, especially on smaller carvings like this. There's only so much you can do with the tools that you hit with the mallet. And since bears are round critters, round is a good description of bears in general. Um, you want to round everything out so you don't have those real sharp edges and make them look a little bit more round. And then a lot of these lines in these craft aids um, that are dotted lines are kind of beveled without cutting. And a modeling tool works really well for a bunch of those as well. Next tool, I'm going to use a, a hair blade tool, which is, this is the fine one. It's actually, it's got... I don't know how many of them there are on here. Six or seven small ridges on it, on a flat. And basically it's like a bunch of little uh, blades held together. And I'm going to use that, it can actually fit in the swivel knife as well, but I have it in this handle instead. And I'm going to use that in little short strokes that I'm going to change the angles a lot on them. But keep them kind of moving in the same general direction that the fur would lay. But I don't want long strokes because that makes it look like it's a bunch of long hair that's flowing. And it's not. And we want a fluffier looking sort of bear. But a little more scraggly too. Is why I'm changing all the angles. Starting to look a little fuzzier. Not sure the camera is catching the, the real detail of it there though. Alright, we're going to go ahead and put some more lines in there. And these are just going to be with the swivel knife. And kind of along a lot of those places that had those dotted lines. And then we're going to go back and put in her rough edges. I 
think I'm going to finish the rest of this area around it with some basket weave. Now I want to put this across at a bit of an angle. But I want to do something that's repeatable so both sides sort of match. So I'm making sure I go from this corner up here down past the bear and down to this corner, down to the point. Now luckily the bear fills enough space. I don't have basket weave going around it and then I have to match up this line with something that comes around. That's always really tricky to do. Um, but I can kind of just fill up this side and then fill up this side and as long as I start on that same straight line it'll look good. should be good here. Now then, finally, I'm going to use a matting tool around here to kind of blend in the edges of the uh, basket weave and to really make the bear stand out a little bit more. It's another one of those things that adds the illusion of depth to your carving is to use a matting tool and mat down the area around it. Again, I'm not sure how well the camera's picking all this up. But I think it's going to look good once it's antiqued and finished. Because I'm not seeing the real fine lines on the screen I'm working with here. We're going to use dye and antique stain to color this. I think it gets a deeper finish that way. Exactly what it sounds like. I'm going to dye it with this light brown oil dye first. And then after that's dry, I'm going to come back with a antique stain, probably a medium brown of that. And that'll get in all the cracks and crevices and highlight everything. And I will dye my lining pieces as well. I probably won't antique those, but I want them to at least somewhat match, even if people don't see most of it at all. Okay, our lining pieces have an acrylic finish on them. They're done. I uh, put them off to the side. These tooled pieces, I'm going to use an antique stain over them as well. And then I like to use a spray uh, finish instead of a wipe-on finish over antiques, just so I don't smear it around, cause any problems with it. Before it has a chance to really dry, I like to go back and just take a damp paper towel and wipe off some of the excess.
I still consider myself an amateur knife maker um, in a lot of ways. And I think I might have left this blade too thick in the original grind. But there's really only one good way to find out, and that's to test it. Now, the usual knife nerd tests, like, oh, it shaves hair off my forearm. Yeah, it does that just fine. It's plenty sharp. It cuts pieces of paper. No big deal. My usual tests for a knife involve how it cuts pieces of leather. If it can skive them. And that tells me more about what it's, how sharp it is. But this is a kitchen knife. And so the only real way to tell if you did a kitchen knife right is to cut things you're going to cut in the kitchen. Okay, so it didn't split anything there. Ooh, I didn't like the sound of that. That was better. So I think I left it a little thick. As I'm having trouble controlling angle a bit here. It's something I could get used to if I use the knife all the time, but I have to hold it out more than I normally would. Normally I'd hold the knife more vertically. So all in all, I give it a grade as acceptable for a kitchen knife, but it's not perfect.